Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. I am I am loving the series that we are in, loving it. It's called For the Love of What If. And we're kind of like running across the whole spectrum of what that question means or could mean in a life. I mean, everything from what if we were able to live with a better sense of our regrets and what to do with them, how they've shaped us, but didn't wallow in them. Or what if we quit that thing that was sort of draining our joy and took a leap to do something new? Um, big questions like, what if, if we asked this, if we did this, what might life look like on the other side? In the case of today's, like absolutely vivacious guest and topic, um, and you need to hang with me, hang with me. What if we decided that maybe the most important person in our lives is ourself? Now, just everybody calm down. Um, I, I know there's just like a cacophony of like garbage self-care and, and me time and me first and, and me always and no one else ever and all those things. Like there's a mess out there around this, like I've reduced this idea to kind of a sound bite. Um, but what I mean by that is what if in a honest, even disruptive way, we looked inward um, to discover what makes us tick. Um, and what we love, where we've lost, who we love and why, who are the voices shaping us and why are we choosing them? I mean, big, big questions. Um, deciding that you are worth this work and investment so much, not just for your own like wellness and life, but because that ends up creating a you who is the best possible person for the people that you love. That means you will then relate to the world as your fullest, healthiest, kindest, wisest, happiest self. And that is not selfish or self-absorbed. Um, we would be able to stop inflicting pain on the people around us, um, that we have yet to address or, um, resolve, right? Um, we would stop projecting, we would stop being passive aggressive, like that would allow us to move through the world differently, which would mean the people that are around us the most would experience a better version of us genuinely. Probably the truest version of ourself is the truth. And so it would actually free us up. So what does it look like to be reminded that you are the most important person in your orbit first before anybody else can be genuinely so? And that deciding that that is a step in the right direction toward um, less overwhelm, less imbalance, less cognitive dissonance, less burnout um, is the right path. So we have someone today, oh my gosh, I'm, <laughs> I'm smitten kitten with today's guest. I'm so enamored. I just finished the interview and I'm, my brain is spinning and I just fed off of his energy so much and you are going to love him. So my guest today has, he teaches and coaches others how to take this step Um by having some really pointed conversations with yourself uh, that will raise your awareness of your thoughts and your actions and your patterns and your responses, reframe how you talk to yourself, and then reconnect with the like the best, most core person you really are and want to be. Today, we have Dr. Corey Yeager. Yes. Dr. Corey, as he is affectionately known, is an NBA psychotherapist um, whose new book called How Am I Doing? 40 Conversations to Have with Yourself invites you to like dig deep, really to, like discover you, to honor your story, explore where you have come from and where you want to go. His philosophy really resonates with me, this notion that intentional and vulnerable and honest 
conversations with yourself can be and will be transformational. I believe this. Um, I feel like we're always trying to walk this road together by reminding each other to treat ourselves with kindness and compassion and grace. But what if we really did it? What if? What if you really did it? Um, What a world. I told Dr. Corey, I think this would change the world. And I mean it. Um, Dr. Corey's just about the kindest guy you could have to walk us through these questions. Questions like, what does it look like for you to live your life with intentionality? Um, what if you could change one experience in your past? What would it be and why? Um, and, I, and this question, which he and I talk about, what is your genius? And what if you were living out of that? Big stuff. Uh, by the way, Dr. Corey was recently hanging out with none other than Oprah herself on the Life You Want series, which was just fire. And our conversation t- today is as well. You're going to love him. You're going to love him. Guys, get excited for this incredible conversation with Dr. Corey. He is the best. Dr. Corey, welcome to the For the Love podcast. I'm just delighted to meet you. Jen, I am just as delighted to join you today um, as this new year kind of takes itself off. It's pretty cool to be able to join you in conversation. Yep. You've got big work to do this year, and so do I. Let's start here. Um, I've filled my listeners in already a little bit about you and who you are and um, really fascinating work that you do. It's just, I'm, I'm just thrilled to know about you and your work that you are in the ear of um, pro athletes and top execs. Oprah, for the love for the love of Oprah. I mean, come on now. So if we can just kind of high level this for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just start up here. Can you tell us a little bit about what the work of a psychotherapist slash life coach slash conversation starter looks like? And Mm -hmm. how you kind of got into this realm? What, What was your path into this space? Okay, so maybe I'll start with the path part. Great. Um, I am a big believer in manifestation. I know everyone doesn't doesn't play with that, but I do. Um, yeah. So when I was working on my master's, um, I'm the first in my family to even get a BA, much less nice. a master's, and then, then a PhD. Um, yeah. I was about to begin the journey of my master's. And my grandmother, who is probably the most, not probably, for sure, is the most wise person that I ever have ever encountered um, and passed away a few years ago. I was about to start the master's the next day. I called her, Granny, I'm about to start this master's. I just want to see if you have any thoughts. And she said, well, baby, I don't even know what you, well, I don't even know what a master's is. But let me give you a piece. She said, let me give you a piece of advice. Whatever your dream is for the master's, write it down, slide it in your Bible, go about your work. So I did. So I wrote down 20 years ago. I still look at this paper today. I wrote down, I want to find a way to use this therapy thing that I'm about to uncover and discover to work in the NFL or the NBA. That's what I wrote down 20 years ago. I wrote it down. No one was doing this work at all. Um, It was very close to the time that the Michael Vick situation had happened with the dog stuff. And I remember thinking, no, I wonder who talked to that kid before. Mm -hmm. I wonder who got in his ear and said, hey, you got to think through this. What are you up to? So I wrote that down. Went about the work of, of, of finishing my master's and then my PhD. And then that manifestation ended up coming my way. Started working, did a little dabble work with the Toronto Raptors and then yeah. ended up getting this job with the Detroit Pistons. So that's kind of the way it came about. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, the best way I can and describe quick, quick follow-up question. Did you just yeah. call the Raptors and be like, hi, I'd like to get uh, inside the heads of your players? To some degree, uh-huh. I started sending out emails. Yeah, because I I started thinking, all right, so I don't know how to even how to even do this. Well, sure, I don't know. send the send the emails out. So I started flooding the NBA and the NFL with emails. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't even have my masters done. I didn't, wasn't even done uh-huh. with my masters at this point. So yeah. I was all right. I was thinking forward. So yeah. I'm flooding it, just trying trying to discover what this therapy thing was. No one really responds. It's like three years. I'm flooding. I kept sending, and then one day I get a return from a person at the Toronto Raptors. I'm like, what, who is this? what is this? 
And it kind of unfolded and talked to them five, seven, eight, nine times. And then, well, we got somebody that may need your service to talk to. Kind of unfolded, unfolded. Then Coach Casey left the head coach at the Raptors at that point, left the Raptors and came to the Pistons and called me and said, I think there's something we'd like you to work on here. I think there's some work for you that could be really helpful. So that goes into my day-to-day work as a as a conversation starter or a psychotherapist and a life coach. Um, the best way I can describe it, Jen, is that I become an uncle to my players. That's what it is. I become an uncle. I happen to be an uncle that has some really deep therapeutic chops, some deep psychological chops that I can talk to you. And there's all kinds of theories and modalities that are moving through my head, but it will sound like a conversation with your a good friend. It won't sound like um, the therapeutic modalities and all this language that people get turned off by. That's moving in my head, but it shouldn't sound like to, that to you. If I'm working with you, it should just sound like I'm talking to Jen. Jen, how you been? Oh, Jen, how'd you handle that? Oh man, that's gotta be tough. Hey, I wonder if you, I wonder if you've ever thought about, so that's therapeutic modality moving through my head but it just sounds like a buddy talking to you, right? So that's what I, I, I do on a regular basis with the, the work in the NBA. Um, I travel on the road. I'm right now currently in Philadelphia. We play the 76ers tonight. Um, I am at all practices. I go to coaches meetings. Uh, I'm around. I'm with the team all the time. So I'm an uncle that's traveling with the team that if they have struggles, they say, hey, Doc, you got a few minutes? I want to talk to you about something. Oh, yeah, come on. Let's talk, right? So that's, that's the best description I can give you on kind of my work and how I got to be who I, who we are now. Before we get into your book, which I love, um, mm-hmm. I'm curious, I mean, cause you manifested this before you even had that diploma, like the ink mm-hmm. wasn't even down. So mm-hmm. you only had at best a guess at what that life would look like at how yeah. you would carve out a space that didn't exist yet. Um, you're assuming a a career that didn't exist. So now that you've had it for a couple decades, Mm -hmm. what's been the most fascinating or surprising or fulfilling part of the job that you actually have now that you can now Mm -hmm. comment on in, in a factual way, uh, that maybe you didn't necessarily, or how could you have seen coming? I really think I'm amazed every day that I look around and say, I'm surrounded by multimillionaires. And these kids are multimillionaires, but not long ago, they had very few dollars in their bank account. Literally, Jim, there's a story. I was working with a young man, um, and we were talking about some of the struggles. Like, he's got all these finances, and everybody wants a piece of it. And he said, Doc, I just got to tell you, before I got drafted, I remember looking at my bank account. And I had $12. I couldn't even take a $20 bill out. I couldn't even go in and take a $20 bill out. I only had $12 in my account. I got drafted, signed. I looked in the account. I had $12 million. So you go from $12 where you can't even take a $20 bill out to now you have $12 million. And you, you what, what do you do with all that? So I'm almost amazed at how people go from very little to almost an overabundance of financial opportunity. That's odd to me, which and it's really cool. And, and it's part of what I talk to them a lot about. Um, so that has stood out to me in terms of my work. The other thing that I would say, Jim, that stands out is how normal these young men are. Hmm. There's normal guys. There's normal guys. guys. Sure. Yes. If you didn't see them because they're seven foot, but if you just talk yes, to right. them, if you just heard their voice and talk to them, you would say it's just a normal dude, not some multi-million millionaire. We've got guys on our team that have made 38 million bucks a year. But if you just talk to them, you would say, ah, maybe he makes 50,000 bucks a year. So how normal they are in their existence and their day-to-day approach and, and, and existence is almost amazing to me. Almost uh, was a surprise, right? When I came into the league, I, I think I was surprised that how normal everything was. So those are just a couple of things that stand out that, that, that are amazing to me. 
That makes sense. I mean, they're still trying to figure out what to do with their wives. They still have yep. an issue with their mom. Yes, like yes. they got in a All fight that. yesterday with a teammate. Yeah, they don't know how to resolve yes. it. They can't sleep. They're just dudes. They're like, just dudes. They're having that's a right. life. They just happen to be really yes. tall and really rich. Hey, but. That's exactly right. <laughs> and they say that though, Jen. You uh-huh. hit the you hit the nail on the head. They yeah. are saying things like. My wife is mad because we have this 10 day road trip and I'm going to yeah. miss the birthday party. Yeah. Uh, and she's, she's pissed at me doc. And For I, sure. I, I don't know what to do. I got to go to work, I, but she's not happy. If she hates our schedule. Yeah. So working through that because the schedule is, all right, that schedule is what pays the bills though. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Mm. Um, is really the work that I love to do mm. every day. I love it. I love that you're taking good, tender care of our elite athletes, hearts and minds and relationships. Um, uh, Nobody's done that really in earnest until recently. They were just our superstars and our performers and our um, idols, but they're just husbands and sons and brothers and dads. And so what worthy work. Um, because they also have complex lives. I mean, going yes. from twelve dollars to twelve million overnight, that's complicated. Yeah. I mean, everybody listening is like, please give me that problem. But that yeah. is complicated. <laughs> that is, is challenging. Is. And so yeah. I'm just I'm thrilled that you are yes. there to take care of their souls and mm. their lives and Thank their you. relationships. It's fantastic. Thank you. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. When we are at our best, we can just feel it. We show up for our people, our friends, our families, our spouses. We show up for ourselves, just firing on all cylinders. But because this is the thing called life, it doesn't always happen this way, right? We get bogged down. We get overwhelmed. We don't show up in the way we want to, right? We wish we were. But working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you. Because when you feel empowered, you're more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. I know for me, therapy has been the ultimate game changer. I've just learned so much. I can't even quantify it. Positive coping skills, how to set boundaries, codependency work, just everything. It truly does empower you to be the best version of yourself. And it isn't just for those who've experienced major traumas. We can all benefit from therapy. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash for the love today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash for the love. My friends at Thistle Farms have a saying that goes like this, love is the most powerful force for change in the world. As we know, Valentine's or Galentine's Day is coming up, y'all. And this year, I invite you to show a little extra love by giving one of Thistle Farms amazing candles, body scrubs, or their luxurious body butter. You've probably heard me wax poetic about their candles before. Literally, I have them in every room. The scents are incredible, like Bulgarian lavender, eucalyptus mint, my favorite, grapefruit jasmine, rose hibiscus, so many more. I love all their delicious smelling bath and body sets too. But what I really love is this. Thistle Farm's beautiful products help fund their mission of creating a safe place for women survivors to heal from trafficking and exploitation. Through their program, women receive free housing, trauma therapy, and meaningful employment. It is incredible. And none of what they do would have been possible without the support of people like you. Your purchase has a direct impact. So I encourage you, friends, to visit thistlefarms.org for gifts to show yourself some love and gifts for the people you love too. They also have incredible apparel and accessories, jewelries, all kinds of stuff. And it all has a purpose and comes with a message. And of course, it supports healing in the lives of countless women at the same time. So don't forget to use my special code for the love for 15% off at checkout. Head over to thistlefarms.org to see all the goodness. I want to talk about, I want to move into talking about your incredible book. How am I doing? I really love this. I really love it. And um, I've got a lot of questions I want to ask you about, but I'd love to hear first, if you don't mind, 
how this idea came to be for you. I mean, obviously I can see it as a deeply integral part of your work, clearly, Mm -hmm. as you help your guys and your folks be introspective and look inside. Mm -hmm. I, I obviously see the connection, but the structure of it, the specific questions you posed, I'd love to hear how this idea came to you and what it was like for you to flesh it out as a writer. Yes. So, Jenna, I'm a big believer, and I write about it in the book, um, that we should trust. I do trust that things will unfold on our behalf. The world will unfold on my behalf, and I believe that. I almost move in the world expecting things to unfold for me. Everywhere I go, well, I just expect expectation that it's going to work for me. I don't know what about everybody else, but I have my expectation, and it has. Um, so when I began my doctoral work, my PhD work at the University of Minnesota, um, I was beginning to talk and think about a conversation around writing a book. I'm like, all right, I'm in a doctorate program. I probably at some point will need to write a book. And I thought about writing the book and forcing the process while I was going through the PhD journey. But something continued, kept saying, slow down. Don't try to do too much. Finish the doctorate. And the voice kept saying, and the book will come find you. You don't have to force it. The book will find you. So I trust that inner voice, that intuitive voice. I trust it deeply, profoundly, more than the average person trusts their intuitive voice. So I said, all right, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to go about my life and I'll wait till the book finds me. So I graduate. I get my PhD. I'm working in the MBA. And then one day I do this documentary for Oprah and Prince Harry called The Me You Can't See. So they followed me as my, I do my work in the, in the MBA and they followed for me for like a year and a half. And then I did a little piece in the documentary that was like maybe 15 minutes long. Um, it was really cool. Got a lot of cool press, but that went out. And then one day I get an email out of nowhere from Harper Collins. I'm like, what the hell? Who's Harper? What is this email? Uh, and it's the, one of the, pub, the, the VPs saying, Hey, I read, I watched your piece on that documentary that me, you can't see. And we spoke as a team and we believe that you have a few books to write. Um, And we'd love to talk to you about writing, starting with one of these books. So I'm like, Oh, so the book found me. Oh, it found me. Right. So I I re-engaged with them. And then what I knew from that position, Jen, is I was go. I get to drive the car. I didn't have to, I get to drive the process. I didn't have to say, all right, well, what, you, what should I write? Do you want me to rewrite that? So I, they wanted me to write. Then I'm going to write it in a way that makes sense to me. Um, so I wrote the book in a very simplistic way because my grandmother would tell me, and oftentimes did, when you get too smart, that's not good, son. Always put information down where the goats can get it. Down low where the goats can get it. Don't put it up high because they can't get to it. So I wrote the book in a way that, any average person can read it and walk away with information that would be helpful for them. Um, so I, one of the things that I do, Jim, my writing process is quite different than most. I like a lot of chaos around me as I write. So my, so my son's playing basketball and wrestling around and the TV's on and I'm sitting at my chocolate leather chair that I write about in the book in the middle of our house and there's chaos ensuing all around. And I'm writing. And that's what that's what I did with the book. Um, and it and it, it, it flowed from that process um, and developed the way it did. So I, I hope people enjoy it. It works. And get something. Yeah, it worked. It I, work, I love that. So, you know, I'm a writer too with HarperCollins and I'm like, there is no one way to skin this cat. Like everybody has a different sort of creative energy. You want noise and chaos. I want dead silence. I want empty space, like whatever gets it on the page, whatever gets it on the page. And I'm just telling you, I love the way that you wrote it. I will not forget that your grandmother said, put it where the goats can get it. I am working that into my repertoire as we speak. Um, and, and and that's the truth. It's so yes. accessible. It's a hundred percent accessible, um, not just for academics, um, but for people. And primarily the reason we really wanted you in this series, we're in a series on the show called what if, and we're asking these big questions like what, just what if, what if we went for it? What if we lived this way? Um, and, and to your inclusion here in this series, what if we asked these questions and then lived out the answers? I, there's a hundred percent chance it would change every life. A hundred percent. Yes. hundred percent. 
If every person asked these questions, gave an honest answer, and then lived out of that, it's, it, it's transformational for sure, no doubt. And so I want to go through a couple of the questions because, I mean, even as I, I have your book and as I was going through them, I had a couple of questions. I was like, I don't know. Let mm. I need to sit with this. Like yes. you, it, they force They're not all easy answers. No, like, not supposed it's to not be. like that. It's, it's not, it's not an easy exercise. It is a sort of, it forces you to get still, to get quiet, to get honest. If you're brave enough. So Jen, um, let me say this. I, yeah. I think you've hit an extremely important point. I wrote the book in such a way that I, my hope is that you can't just find a quick answer to all of them. Many of them, I want you to sit with the, 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 the question and say, God, I've never thought about that. Hold on. I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, so that's the space we want to occupy. Because now what we want to do, instead of moving straight to understanding, I want to move first to awareness, right? Let's first be aware. Okay, I'm aware that I don't, under, I don't know what that answer is. I'm aware that I've never thought about that ever in my life. And I'm aware that I can play with that. I can play with that in such a way that it may produce something for me in my life. I'll play with the concept of what is your genius. I haven't thought about that. Most people have never thought about being a genius ever. Totally. They would tell you, I'm not a genius. I have no genius. But if someone says, no, be still, think through this. Yes, you do have a genius. What is it? If you had to sit with that and play with that and grind with that, it would produce you. And actually, not just the answer. The answer is not the key. The process towards the answer, the things that you play with, that you work through, that you cry through, that you laugh about, that is what we want more of. Because in that process, Jim, I know myself better. That's right. I know I know me better, and that's what the book is asking for. But let me shut up. I didn't mean I interrupted you. I didn't. Oh no, I, I love it. That's I, literally you get me excited. The, look, you get me this excited. is the conversation I want to have with you. I I I really <laughs> love that approach, and I love to hear you say it's the process. The magic is in the process. Um, because the way that you've written, and this is just goes to who you are. This is a part of your tone and your energy and your approach to human people. Um, you have, you've posed it all and framed it in such a way that what you really invite the reader to do is maintain a generous spirit of curiosity, about themselves. It isn't like, I think some people might hear us say, I'm asking you a bunch of questions that you need to answer. And it might feel like, Oh hell, uh, uh, are, are these like bringing me to account? Like I, I haven't accomplished everything. It's not like that. It's not like a list of pat answers that you're supposed to have by a certain point in your life. That's not at all the approach more. It's this okay, let's get real curious about like, who am I and what moves me and what's inside of me and what's possible in me and for me. And I like how you keep using the word play. It does have that sense to it. Like, come on in, like everybody pull up to the table. Like this isn't meant to be judgmental or self-righteous or um, shame-based. Of course, not that it's the opposite. And I'm curious if that has been your response from your readers. I'm sure it has. It been. has been. I've had a ton of people and people. It's so fun to see people engage with the book and walk away from the book saying, hey, the question, a number of those questions I've never considered, and they may be changing how I see my life. That's what I want. And where does that come from? What's the root of that? Curiosity. You're not going to get, you're not going to change anything in your life, unless you first begin with the curiosity that says, do I like that? How in the heck did I get there? Why? Right. There's a question in the book about value systems. I believe that at about 9, 10, 11, up into the 12, 13 year old range, we are handed a set of values. Our people around us or my grandparents, my mom, dad, my brother, they, they handed me a set of values. I didn't really get much say in it. They handed it to me and I agreed with it because I love my people. So then after I'm 12, 13, 14 years old, I move into the world, holding those values, moving through the world with those values, and never really re-engaging or checking in with myself to say, does that still work for me? 
So I got those values handed to me at 12 years old. I'm now 53, Jen. Have I done any engagement or re-engagement with saying, does that still fit? Does that still work for me? But, but we haven't done that. So being curious, asking those questions, because, and one of the reasons I say, Jen, that we won't be curious is because we may not want the answers. We don't really want the answers. Because if I re-engage and, be, and, and act in a curious fashion about the value systems I have, I may end up saying, that doesn't fit for me anymore. And I love my mom and my grandparents, but the way they, that value system that they loved and they handed me, that doesn't really work for me. I don't necessarily see the world that way anymore. So now I have a version of invisible loyalty or disloyalty that I don't want to, I'm now struggling. And what is that? That's the concept of cognitive dissonance. I have new info, people have handed me the value system. I have new information that combats with that value system at 53. And now I have to say, what do you do with that? Do, do I just say, Corey, just shut up and keep doing the things that they told you to do? Because sometimes that's the answer. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to shut up because I don't want that ripple. I don't want that struggle. So I'm just going to be still. But many times the answer may be, I'm not going to be still. I'm not going to do that. That doesn't work for me anymore. I'm going to move in a way that's different than that. And so we don't want it. That's, so playing with that curiosity can produce some things that, we, that make us scared. And that's okay. That's okay. We, we, fear is not a bad thing. Fear just means I can't manage all this stuff that's going on in my head. I can't manage it all. That's all right. We don't have to manage it all today. We don't have to, right? I can say, all right, I didn't, I'm, I'm nervous about this, but I'm not. Go, I'm, I'm gonna keep playing with this. I'm gonna keep pushing and, and pulling on little pieces, and then I'll figure it out one, at one point. But I'm not gonna avoid it. Yeah. So. I love it that those questions and then the process and the curiosity and then ultimately the end, this is the path to growth. This is how people grow. It's precisely sure. how. And so you've just really handed everybody a roadmap. Um, like yeah. start here. Here are 40 questions to start with. They're not the, every question on earth to ask, but there are 40 really good ones. And if we ask them, they would matter. One of your questions is, Who's the most important person in your life? Which I love. I love the question. And again, it may seem like I could rattle that off pretty quickly, but you invite the reader to go deeper um, into the story. And there's a lot to mine there. Can you talk about that particular question, maybe in a personal context or why you think that one matters? Why did that one get a slot in the 40 questions you posed? Yeah, so I'm going to, as I answer that question, I want to touch on something that you said. You talked okay. used the word grow, growth. I think that we have to slow down and say, okay, so what is, how do we grow? And is there any indication of growth? And I believe that there's an indicator of growth and it's pain or discomfort. That anytime you have discomfort or, or dealing with something that may be painful, slow down for a second and say, all right, what am I birthing into? Right? Because birth is painful. But something beautiful is going to come from it. But does it feel good? Doesn't feel good. But I'm not, that's an indicator. Pain should be, discomfort should be an indicator that I'm growing in to something that is quite important. Um, so I think this, this indicator is something that, that will give us a signal. Instead of just saying, I have discomfort. Because if we have discomfort for the sake of discomfort, Jen, we're going to avoid it. I don't want it. Get it away from me. But if I see discomfort as a signal that I'm growing, I may deal with that a little more. I may take that a little bit more if it's signaling to me those labor pains are signaling to me that I'm about to birth. I'll deal with them. I'll deal with them, right? Um, So in terms of who is that most important person, I came to understand that because I was asking our players and my clients and and day-to-day approaches um, who that person was. And over and over and over, I was getting an answer that put the the individual in the fourth, fifth, seventh spot in their own life. Well, my mom and then my dad and then my wife and then my kids, those two, three kids. And and then and I I kept waiting for them to say them and they would be at number 12 and they hadn't said themselves. So I thought about I started poking. So. I hear you saying all those people are more important or the most important. Where do you come in? That's where I got curious with them. Where do you come in? And then the aha uh-uh would happen. Yeah. Oh, I, I never even that. thought about themselves. Right. And then people try to spin it, Jim. 
Well, you didn't say I was included when you asked. No, I didn't. No, don't put that on me. You answered the question the way you answered it. I didn't tell you that you couldn't put yourself first. I didn't say that. Um, So playing with that in such a way allowed me to say, I want to start the book off with this cornerstone question. Um, Because I saw my daddy who died at 15, who was to me the most important person in the world, um, and then my grandmother and my grandfather and all those, my friends and that circle of friends that I had at 22, that was probably 30 people wide. And now I look around at 53 and my circle has two or three people. I went from 25 or 30 people in my circle, all of them very important to me, to now 53. There's like three people outside of my family that, that I would say are important. Um, so I thought that this question was a cornerstone question to start the book off in understanding I'm the most important because the other questions, the 39 other questions really are engaging. You have to have that frame first before you can start to play with the rest. So that's kind of where I came up with who's the most important and and used it first. I consider myself fairly self-actualized and well-read and in pretty good possession of um, confidence and agency. And I would have missed that question. I'd have missed it. I'd have, I'd have turned it. outward uh, yeah. so quickly. We're conditioned to do so. Um, yes. And so yes. I I love this leadership. You are inviting us to consider our worlds in new and healthy ways um, that isn't necessarily the norm. This is you and I were talking before we started recording that your work never ends because you are out here normalizing wellness and mental health and mm-hmm. I I told you, you have job security because it is not normalized and this, there's so much work to be done. I want to, there's, there's two questions that you have in the book. You've mentioned one of them. I think they're going to, I, my guess is they make people uncomfortable, um, Mm -hmm. either because they've never thought about them or it feels self-centered. We're not, again, we're not um, conditioned to think this way. Uh, and so, but I love, uh, back to my series, I love the what if possibilities that exist hovering over these two questions in any given life. And so mm-hmm. one you mentioned, what is your genius? Uh, the Nobody's ever heard that before. Nobody knows. No. no one's ever been asked that before. What is your genius? And then you also ask, what do you love most about being you? Yes. Both of those are phenomenal to me. I just, I can only imagine that people just put their pen down like, Hey, I could have, I don't know. Like, um, I would love to hear you talk about those questions and what the benefits to those answers and really the process is, as you mentioned earlier, the process of getting to those answers and how you even begin to coach somebody who goes, "I, I don't have any idea even where to start on either one of those things. Yep. So I believe it is similar to this, especially the question of what do you love most about yourself? I think this this is similar to someone that has been bruised in relationships and is avoiding of engaging in new relationships. They'll, they'll avoid, they'll they'll find ways not to engage with someone that may want to date them. They will send out a signal to the world that I don't want to date. I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm not ready for that. I think that that's what we've done with ourselves. I submit that it is time for us to have a love affair with ourselves. I need to love me. And I'm glad my wife loves me. And I'm glad my mama loves me and my, my kids love me. I'm glad, Jen, that they love me. Most important love that I'm going to have is mine. That I have to love Corey. I have to find a way to love Corey. And I submit that the book is asking us those curiosities and questions So we can get to know, if you're going to fall in love with someone, you better know who they are. So how, if if you don't know yourself, it's very hard to love yourself. If I don't know who I am, if we don't know someone else, I really can't fall in love with you because I don't know you. So fall in finding ways to slow things down, Jen, and I believe that's one of the things that we've got to do a better job of. You spoke about it as the new year came. You said, hey, I am kind of took my time to start the new year. Yes, slow things down right so this question of engaging about who how the things that we love about ourselves is about falling in love taking that slow bite-sized approach to love affair with self and the way you can do that is say so what 
what do I love about me? So like for me, Jen, I love my generosity. I want to take care of people. People, if you're going to be around me, I'm going to be the person in the group that says, I got dinner. It's on me tonight. And you shut, everybody shut up. I got, give me, bring me the bill. That's, it does something for me. It feeds me that I can take care of people. That's probably why I got into the profession I'm in. I want to make sure that I can take care of people around me. Um, because if I slow down and think, Jen, about my life, I look back and say, God, I have just been blessed. I, like, I don't, I haven't had a lot of major struggles, right? I hear other people and the struggles that they had. I'm like, geez, I didn't really, I have to really search for struggles. Well, my dad died at 15. But other than that, I, man, it's been golden. So if that's the case for me, and I'm hearing the stories of others that have struggled, then let me take care of. Let me, let me bring people into my circle and take care of in a generous, um, a genuine and generous way. Um, and I think that is connected to this love affair of finding out who we are. What are those things that, that we really like about ourselves? Um, and it doesn't, and that's not about figuring out what other people like about you. So I didn't ask that question. It's good. I tell mm. people all the time, hey, good you're distinction. not answering, uh, you're answering a question I did not ask. Uh, I don't want you to ask. I say it to my sons all the time. I ask them a question. They start answering something. Hey, you're now answering a question I didn't ask. Don't answer that so question. Good. So you can answer that question for someone else. The question I ask you is not what other people think uh, that, that they love about you. What do you love about you? And people get stuck, and that's okay. Get stuck, stuck in that space, play in that space, come back and forth, move to the next chapter, and then come back to that. But find ways to understand what it is that makes you who you are, that makes you smile about yourself. And in that, that genius will find you'll find that genius answer as well. Right. Because I think we have it, Jen. We all I know. I don't think we have. I know we all have genius. Me too. We don't see it as genius. So if we slow it down, engage with ourselves, move with that curiosity, we'll say, well, the thing I love about myself is probably very connected to the thing that I'm a genius. Oh, those those things. Oh, man, I'm starting to see connections here. Um, and, and the book, I think, is a web of connections. Um, and, and you can jump around. You don't have to start with, with one and go through 40. You can jump around. Um, that, that's my thought. I could be off, but that's, that's how I see I it. I love it. Yeah, it, those are, you, you tug one thread and it's connected to the next. Yes, and that's a beautiful thing. Our lives are, you, you've chosen 40 questions that are very linked and they're interwoven and together it makes up a whole human person. Mm -hmm. And so whichever order anybody tackles them in, it's incredibly illuminating. And it, it introduces us to this idea. Some of my favorite um, therapists, you know, use the term self-compassion which is mm -hmm. just this kindness of spirit directed at our own selves, which we are mm -hmm. terrible at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're the meanest, the meanest voices in our heads are our own. And Ooh, so that, just yeah. the meanest. And Ooh. so it's a discipline to learn. I got something for you. To, I got what? something for you. All so right. you, you, you just triggered me that we are the meanest in our own heads, the meanest to, as of anyone in this world. So one thing I talk about for people to understand that deeply, if you say, all right, so I'm just going to slow down and I'm going to tune in the way I talk to myself. I'm yeah. not going to try to do anything about it. I'm not going to try to fix it. I'm just going to pay attention to how I talk to myself. And if you do that, you'll say, God, many times I'm really negative with myself. And if we had someone hmm. take a transcript of those negative thoughts, type it out and hand it to a stranger yeah. and tell the stranger to read it to us. Say yeah. those words to me. We would run from that person. That's right. We would try to get away from them as quickly as possible. But we do it to ourselves all day, over and over. Corey, you're an idiot. You're not going to get this done. You're just stupid. You're not going to get that job. You're not going to get the. No one wants to talk to you, right? We're just all day. If somebody, but if someone else did that to us, Jen, we would we'd be avoiding. We would actually be ready almost to fight with that person. At the very least, to verbally fight with them. That's right. But we do it to ourselves all day long. So we've got to do better with that. And, I, and that's why I submit that it's not about trying to jump and change it today. 
first tune into it. You got to be aware of it. All right, how am I talking? Man, I'm negative. Man, I, now you can slowly, one by one, catch some of those thoughts in the middle of those thoughts and say, does that serve me? No, it doesn't. Then I'm not going to do that. I'm going to replace that thought with something better, right? Uh, and I think, and we can do that. I don't think we're aware of it. Uh, right. We're not. Um, that's not a life sentence. Um, that right. way of thinking, we really can retrain our minds. We can create new pathways. We can switch the narrative. We can reverse that mm-hmm. sort of punishing self-talk. But it does require everything that you're asking of us in your book, which is intention. Like it mm-hmm. requires intention. We just cannot default to our values, our perspectives, what used to work, whatever voices on autopilot in our heads. I mean, that'll just keep going without any intervention, but it's this, it's this disruption. And this is a little bit disruptive. Like the the work of this is, and you mentioned that earlier, and I appreciate you making room for the fact that um, some of this will feel disruptive because it is. Something super popular to talk about this time of year is New Year's resolutions, of course. But I can tell you something. I've really never been a resolutions girl. I love them in theory, but in practice, it's just really never taken hold. For It feels like a lot of pressure on top of already feeling a lot of pressure because life. So what I like to do is this. I think about areas of my life where I want to turn the dial just a little bit. Like just adjust and recalibrate and set a small intention, maybe learn something new. Perhaps that's how you're exploring the new waters of 2023 too. If so, I'd love to invite you to check out my Me Course series. Me Course is my e-course series designed to help you show up better for yourself, for your family, and really everyone else. It's inspirational, it's educational, and it's actionable. Really, it is for all of us. And it's content that we can really use to create the change we want. I'm always joined by the most amazing category experts in everything from finance to wellness, faith, content creation, cooking, parenting, and more. Each me course is on demand with four 15-minute-ish learning videos, along with digital resources, additional bonus videos, and so much more. Plus, you get access to our private community of learners. Explore more about each course and check out the incredible savings at mecourse.org. Happy New Year, everyone. Let's do this. I want to ask you about one more question in the book before we land it here. But um, in this exact series, we did an entire episode with a guest whose um, PhD work revolves around this idea of regret. And he has reframed regret and wrote a whole book on how regret is useful and how to approach it in a different way. It's also a disruption of the way that we generally process regret. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions that you ask is what is the mistake you have learned most from in your life, which is very similar to what mm-hmm. he and I discussed that this, if, if we'll let it, it'll be our best teacher. Um, yes. If we'll allow it to be our teacher. And so I wonder if you could talk about the process you have of helping people walk through this, particularly by looking at small mistakes first, and then perhaps easing up um, into yes. the ones that kind of haunt us. Um, yeah. And then you recommend a course of action to follow up at that point. Can you sort of talk yeah. about that for a minute? Yeah, I think this this concept of regret and looking back at things that if we could change one thing, um, I think it calls for a bite-sized approach um, because we're not going to just jump in and change all the things that we regret. Um, it is the African proverb of how do you eat elephant? One bite at a time. You just take a bite of it. You don't have to try to eat the whole thing. Just take a bite and figure it out as we move. Um, so going back into our past, um, I think that we have to recognize that memory, past, regret, all those things are in the past. Um, that memory is it plays a significant role in our lives. And it's not just to reflect on what has happened, but it is rather to inform us about where we're headed, right? So if I can look back and use my memory, use that to inform where I'm headed, right? I, what did I learn? It pushes it forward. So that bite-sized approach um, 
is not just set up so you can flash back and turn it into a movie of, of regret that doesn't serve us. Um, utilize that to service as we move forward. Um, I'm also reminded, Janet, I know I go all over the place, but when I get excited about conversations, I got I 12 million things and you've done it to me today um, that, that pop up. This concept of regret reminds me of a concept that I'm playing a lot with now, is, and that's the idea of jealousy, right? So that we have um, things that we get jealous about with ourselves, which is really regret, or with other people. And really what we have to realize is that jealousy cannot occur, does not occur without first having the desire. You have to desire something to be jealous. You can't be jealous of something you don't desire. If I, if I never want to live in a cold, cold climate and you have a beautiful cabin in northern Minnesota, I can't be jealous of that because I hate the cold, right? So I won't be jealous of it. But if there's something that you have that I don't have, now, all of a sudden, that desire is that jealousy kicks in. And that's the root that I desire something that you have. So instead of using jealousy and just letting it sit, how about if we looked at those jealous moments, understood it as desire, and allowed that to become a GPS that told us where we wanted to head? I love that Jen has that beach home. And I'm jealous about that. I want the beach home. So how about instead of being jealous, I said, now, I'm going to target some. I want that. I'm going to figure out a way that I can get that done. And I want to say, hey, Jen, so how long did you, when did you buy the beach home? How did you figure out that you could figure, financially fit that into what you're up to? Right? So now I allow that thing that I'm jealous about, that desire that I hold deeply, to become a point on the map that I can drive towards. As opposed to just saying, I hate that Jen has that house. She doesn't deserve it the way I do. I deserve that more than she does. And then what I would also do is get friends beside me to say, yeah, do you see that Jim sees? She's putting it on Facebook again. Look at her. She's trying to rub it in our face. See, so what I'll do is I'll go get a team of people to come with me in my jealousy. Now I got 12 people that we said we don't like Jim. Why? Yeah, she just tries to be too much. She's uppity. Yeah, because I'm jealous of Jim. I desire what Jen has, right? So if we can find ways to flip some of those things, and I think this is connected to that idea of regret, um, that, that those stories, those things that we would like to change in our past, we must first understand what they are and then figure out, so why do I want to change that? What would, what would it do that would be different? And then how does that inform where I am and where I'm headed, right? I see a plethora of questions that we have there, but again, I think that's what the book is trying to do is be curious. The book is not trying to give you answers. I am a big believer, Jim, that we all hold the answers to everything we need. Everything that happens in my life today, I am fully equipped for. Anything that occurs, I'm fully equipped for, for this moment. Um, and if we trust that, if we understand that our, our lives as such, um, then we can move with confidence. In our, right? You, you, Jen, you do it. I don't know you well. But I can tell you move with a, a level of confidence in your life. I do the same. It's what I said earlier. I almost expect for things to unfold. I'm not being cocky about it. But my expectation is I got everything I need. I'm going to move in the world with an expectation that things will unfold for me and those around me. And I won't hold that just for me. I'll be generous with it. I'm not going to be greedy. I'm going to always be generous. My wife and I have had many an argument that... Honey, if you give me, if I go take 500 bucks out of the bank, I'm going to get that shit away. I'm going to give it away. I'm going to say, hey, you need a man. Come here. I got a, I got a question for you. If you answer 100 bucks, that's who I am. <laughs> right? So the, the arguments that we had, I said, but honey, me giving has gotten us to some degree where we are today. Yeah. I'm never going to stop giving. Yeah. Because I think it comes back a thousand fold if it's genuine. Yeah. yeah. Right? So. I know I hit a billion. No, no, I love it. <laughs> and I like that example because it's sort of framing around this idea of jealousy. You know, you started with a ubiquitous experience. You want what somebody else has. That's common. There's nothing, there's no morality attached to that. Nope. And it's just a normal human way to feel about something. Yep. But then you attach it one way or another. You can attach it to, I wonder what it would look like for me to set that as an intention for my life. And that takes you down this road all the way, mm. maybe to it. 
But yes. just the tiniest tweak, and this way you decide to disparage the person who has who has yeah. it. You you follow that down. But you're all the way down a road you do not want to be on, which includes no. resentment and bitterness. And you are a contagion among mm. your people. And yes. these matter, these little early toggles, when we've got this moment, to we get to figure out how we want to respond to it. That's right. It may only take us five degrees off at that first decision, but you play that out and you're in yes. wor- your world's apart at the end of it. And so yes. these matter. This mindfulness sure. matters. These perspectives yeah. matters. This mindset matters. And so I, yeah. I think this is important work. And yeah. I, I, it excites me to think about what people could discover at the end of it. Mm-hmm. Um, what, mm-hmm. what would be sort of um, awakened in their yeah. own hearts and minds and souls. And then ultimately their lives. It's really exciting. And I love it. And I think you're fantastic. <laughs> I wish I was an NBA player so you could just coach me every day. Every day. I've got problems. Sheesh. Me <laughs> too, Jen. Me too. <laughs> um, Dr. Corey, now you asked oh, us all the questions. I have one funny. more for you. This is my all one right. question. I actually ask okay. everybody this. Every episode, yeah. the end of every episode, no matter what series you're in. So, yeah. uh, by the way, I would love for you to uh, answer this however you want. Like, there's okay. no, you can answer this earnestly, or you can answer this absurdly, and we get it all, and we love it all. So, I don't care. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. I borrowed this question from a priest that I love, and she asked this question. Um, what is saving your life right now? What is saving my life right now? Mm -hmm. Just right now. What is saving my life right now? I think what is saving my life right now is my belief that I have a multiplicity of options that will all be unbelievably beautiful. Mm. I have tons of options in my life and all of them are absolutely beautiful. So I'm not shrunk to well, you only have these one or two mm-hmm. options and, and, and you, that's all you got. No, I think there's a multiplicity. I'm an author. I'm working in the NBA. I love to do work in schools with young people. Yeah. Um, I think, right? I think there's a ton yeah. of things. Um, and I think that's exciting and it's saving yeah. my life because I know whatever, kind of what you said, whatever journey I choose, I'm going to yeah. smile. That's I'm going to smile. And I'm going to be supportive of others in that journey. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not stuck to one roadway. So good. Right. That yeah. takes all the pressure off this in this invented idea that there's one right path for each of us and God help us if we don't figure it out. That's, right. uh, that's actually 100%. not true. The world is that's way right. more abundant than that. It is not that scarce. Yes. So yes. beautiful. Yes. The, okay. The law Last. of abundance, the law of abundance. I believe the in it. Law of abundance. Yes, there's I believe more in it for all of us. But we, but if you don't believe in it, you have scarcity. That's right. You, I don't have enough. Like, oh my God, I only yeah. have enough to pay the bills. In it. Yeah, well, that's what you're gonna always have. That's right. But I, that's right. But I believe that there's more than enough, and I'm gonna get my fair share, and I don't have to. I don't have to worry about it. It's coming. Yeah, I ain't yeah. worried. I don't worry. Yeah. I have young writers come to me all the time. I've written a bunch of books, and they come to me and say. I don't know. The field is crowded. I'm like, there is always room for more. There's more room for more creativity, more innovation, more stories, more literature, more genius, like more leadership there. It will never run dry. Absolutely never. And so pull up a seat to the table. It's already yours. I don't need to give you permission. Your seat has your name on it. Let's go. I believe in abundance. I've seen it. And be unique. Bring your your own unique, right? So you may be writing in a space as an author that a lot of people are writing in, but you have a unique version of it. Mine's unique. No no one is ever in this world, all the billions of people that have been on this earth, no one has experienced what Corey has. That's right. No one. And no one, after it's time for me to go, no one will ever experience what Corey has. That's right. That's right. So my my unique experience will be important as we move through life. Yep. You do what you do in the way that only you can do it. The end. Yep. And that's true 100%. for every single person, which is yes. why I love your genius question, because everybody has it. All right. Yes. Will you please tell my listeners where they can find you, where they can find your book? They're going to want more of this. I know it for sure. So how do they get more Dr. Corey? 
Yeah, so the book is kind of everywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any of the major sellers. Um, if you f- want to find me on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or Twitter, it's really Dr. Corey Yeager, C-O-R-E-Y-Y-E-A-G-E-R. Um, you can find me at any of those social outlets. Um, but you can find the book if you Google How Am I Doing, 40 Conversations to Have With Yourself. You're going to find it everywhere. Um, yep. So yep. you'll find me. You'll find me. I'm not hard to find. Yeah. And if we play our cards right, we'll see you at a game. That's right. So uh-huh. That's right. we'll look for you on that That's sideline. Right. We know you got those good seats. Yep. We know you yes, do. You've earned do. it. You've earned yep. it. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. I'm so happy to have met you and just moved by your work and really proud of you and thrilled at your leadership in the world. And I'm just so grateful for your investment in my community today. So thank you times a million for coming on today. It was, it was absolutely a blast. And you did a great job and I appreciate it. Dr. Corey Yeager, everybody love it. Love him. Love these ideas. Um, I love him right now. I I mean, how long are we going to go before we ask and answer these questions? And what are we waiting for? Um, Yes, for sure. They could be disruptive. But some of our patterns and thoughts should be disrupted. And so I like this. I like this idea of if I let me start with myself instead of outsourcing all my angst, all my aggression, all my blame, instead of just turning outward going Um, life has happened to me. What about this? Start with me. Let's start with the hard questions for myself. I love it. I love it. And I think this is fantastic. If you go to jenhatmaker.com under the podcast tab, we will have this episode, all the show notes, and we'll round up all the links for you. So you can follow Dr. Corey on socials and get a quick link to his book and every other resource we can find um, from him for you. See you next week.